Hi, everybody. Welcome to Adulting 101 from the Doherty County Public Library. I'm Christina Shepard, and I'm the head of reference. And our adulting series are some tasks that you probably didn't learn when you were at school, but there are nice little tips and hints that most grown-ups need to know in order to do well. So this month, we are focusing on domesticity, which are things that we do with where we're living. So we'll talk a little bit about um, getting your own place. We'll talk a little about ways to keep that place maintained and maybe some quick little repairs, um, maybe one made by yours truly, on uh, things that you can do around the house that won't upset landlords and will help keep the space you're in nice. So I'm going to start today by showing you some rather new resources we have on our website that will lead into our discussion on getting a new place. So here I am on docolib.org or D-O-C-O-L-I-B.org, the library's homepage. And if we come over here to the side where it says eBooks, we have more than just um, audiobooks or eBooks that you read on a reader, but we've now gotten some that we have hard copies of that we have unlimited eBooks of, mostly reference resources, but there's some good things in here as well. Um, for those of you who haven't heard already, since this is airing right at the last week of September, RB Digital has purchased Overdrive and Darty County, along with most of the Georgia Pine system, will be moving from RB Digital to Libby by Overdrive. So if you haven't already heard, go ahead and download the Libby app, but we won't be able to access our information until October 1st. If you had any holds on RB Digital, those will not transfer over, nor will your um, history. So if you want to keep track of what you read while you were an RD Di RB Digital member, you'll need to download those or write them down or something so that you have a list of it. We're very much looking forward to working with Libby and Overdrive again. Moving on, here we have Salem Press and we have Weiss Ratings in Gray House. Salem Press, we have some of our reference resources. Um, there's some key topics that, uh, like the opinion series, which are opinions through history on different topics like gun control, voters' responsibilities, um, presidential authority. And what it is, is essays, speeches, coverage, from 1800s, maybe even 1700s. I think one of them went all the way back to the Greeks and the BC. Um, but these topics that um, are still prevalent today, that you have the history behind them and um, more material with it. It's not just, oh, this is my opinion. It's authoritative, authoritative opinions. So where I wanted to take you here is the Weiss Ratings in Gray House Publishing. We have recently, recently just purchased um, some of these books, and I just think they're absolutely amazing, which is why I want to share them with you. So when we first get there, it's going to ask for your library card number. So go ahead and type that in. All right. When I got in here and it says, sorry, we couldn't find the page you were looking for. And that's okay, because I think what it tries to do is go to a homepage, which is going to show you a lot more material than what we really need. What we have up here are the financial literacy tools. These right here, each of these sections have like eight different books in them. So for financial literacy tools, today I want us to look at just the basics. So if I'm clicking on the basics, up is going to come these next eight books that are relevant to that. And these are great, 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 great adulting 101 subjects. How to manage debt, how to make and stick to a budget, how to um, buy and understand auto insurance, renting apartments and understanding your rights as a renter, um, the understanding the cost of college student loans and how you're going to pay them back. Starting a 401k. You know, you're young. It's the best time to start, you guys. Understanding health insurance, which is what we're going to focus on in October, and also what we need to know about checking accounts. So I brought us here today because in domesticity, one of the first things you need to do to be domestic is to kind of have a place to be in. So I wanted us to look at this renting an apartment and understanding renters insurance guide. So as I click on it, it just kind of comes up as a PDF. And the really cool thing about this, guys, is yes, it's in my computer, but all 104 pages that are in the book, if I were to get it from the library and check it out, are right here. And with it being a PDF on here, if there's a worksheet that's in here that you really like, you could just print it out and use it where you can't write my library book. So in this book, it's going to cover 
several areas of renting an apartment. It's going to cover understanding your insurance. And then, of course, inform us about some of the other books that we've got going on, such as making and sticking to a budget, managing debt, all those that we just went over a little bit ago. This page intentionally left blank. Moving on, so literacy basics about renting an apartment. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get ready to rent an apartment, which could be frightening. Um, you'll need to ask yourself and think about, will I be able to afford rent? Um, there's things that you need to consider when you're looking into the lease of that. So the very first thing before renting apartment is you need to make a budget. And one thing they're gonna let you know is that your rent should take up no more than 33% of your income. Um, in fact, 28% is what I was originally taught. So if I'm bringing home a thousand bucks, my rent should not be more than $280. All right. Next thing you'll want to look at is um, furnishings, especially if this is your first place and you've never lived on your own. You're going to want a bed. You're going to want a, a couch. You might need a table. You're going to need dishes to eat on. All these are things to consider. My personal tip would be uh, yard sales. I got quite a few of my beginnings from yard sales. The next part of getting a place on your own will be searching for the actual apartments. So you already know your budget. You know what you're going to be looking for. So as you're going through these places, you're going to want to look around to see, are these safe places that I want to be in? Um, maybe I like this building during the day. I should think about it and drive through at night and see if it's the same neighborhood when the lights are out. Paperwork that you're going to need. A lot of landlords or property companies are going to want your driver's license, your recent pay stubs. Some may need a resume. Some may need character references. Some like other official documents as well. The ones we've done have asked for references. They ask for references and they will call to see how your renting history was with the per people before you. Once your paperwork is in order, you found your place, the next thing you're gonna do is work out a lease. The lease is your contract. It's your legal, legal agreement in between you and your landlord. You'll wanna make sure that you read that clearly because um, it lines out who's responsible for what. So I lease a house and it's my responsibility to take care of the yard care and the maintenance of that. Um, it's my responsibility to keep it clean. However, if something like the heating and air breaks, is that my responsibility or is that the landlord's responsibility? That's stuff that you'll want to look into. Upfront costs. Most of the time when you move out of your home into a place and you are leasing, they will ask for your first and last month at the exact time that you are moving in or they may ask for what's called a deposit. The security deposit is usually fairly close to the amount of rent and they keep that money. And if everything is in tip top shape when you move out, you get that money back. If they have to shampoo the carpet or redo the carpet after you move out, they have to patch a hole in the wall, all that's gonna come out of that security deposit. And so you'll get back what was left if there was any. You should also be careful because if your damages cost more than what you left in your deposit, you may actually owe them money by the end of it. You also want to look into the length of your lease. Um, most leases around here are for about a year. Sometimes you can find some for a little bit shorter, some a little bit longer. After that year is up, you need to know what's happening. Is it a month by month lease? Do you have to redo another lease? Um, where do you go from there? We've been lucky enough with ours that we sign one year list and then they allow us to go month to month after that. Um, ongoing things that you may need to pay for. Um, some leases will cover water and electric. Some expect you to cover water and electric. Is there internet available? Will they allow drilling into the house to get internet available if it is not already? Who covers the trash collection? Who covers, I mean, uh, variables of things. So you'll want to make sure that's on there. Something else that is asked about on most leases is who is going to be in that house. And if somebody moves in there that was not on the lease, you need to make sure that they are added or contact the landlord. Because landlords can take you out of that lease for letting somebody stay with you longer than two weeks. So you'll want to make sure you read that and you keep them on the up and up. Pets are usually a line item on there. If they allow pets, they charge a little extra for them. Insurance. 
Um, landlords will usually make you get insurance. If they don't, you should anyway. Insurance is not much. I think the first time I did it was like $12 a month. I've never seen it above 20 a month. And what this does is it protects you against the house being broken into. It'll also protect your materials against something unnatural like a fire. You're not responsible for the house, but all the things inside of it, your, in, your landlord is not responsible for what happens to your material possessions in the case of a damage to the house. If somebody drives through your front door, who's going to repay for all that? I can tell you it's not going to be the landlord. So get yourself covered with that little bit of insurance. Uh, if you have to leave, um, you got called on tour somewhere. There are some leases will allow you to sublet, which means that you allow somebody else to do your lease for a amount of time. You hear about this a lot in the bigger cities, not so much down here, where I move out, I'm still responsible for my monthly payment, so I allow somebody else to move in my place, and then they pay me, I pay the landlord. That still has to go through your landlord. You can't just do it all on your own. All right, we talked about some of these already. Who's in charge? Maintenance, who does repairs? Make sure you read all that and beware of any time they say, oh yeah, we got that, we got that, because verbals aren't written down and they don't really hold in court. Keep a copy of your lease when you sign it. And there can be legal action against defaulting on it. And there are rules in leases for domestic violence. There are rules in there for military personnel. And there is always things that landlords cannot do that you may feel that are being violated, such as coming into your home uninvited without giving you notice. Things like that are you are protected against. So that's the main thing I wanted you to know when you're getting into it. This book will cover more. It's going more into detail here about the different kinds of insurance, what you should look for in your insurance. Um, things that are commonly covered and not covered. Here in Albany, I know that flooding has been an issue. Usually that is something that is not covered. Um, just be aware that you may need a natural disaster insurance to cover some of those things. And um, this is one of the things I want to show you and why I kept scrolling is this is the home inventory worksheet. Is this something your insurance companies usually ask you to fill out anytime there's a theft? It's sometimes they'll ask you to fill it out before they even insure you. So this is something good to keep so that you know what was in your house when you went in. You also have the value of what it will be if anything were to happen. And from this being the book that's online, I could easily go up here and just print page 27. And I have a copy of that that I could fill in myself. And it goes on for quite a few pages here to make sure it covers everything. So these books cover a lot more than all of this. It's going on about common turns, doing claims. It goes on to tell you about home insurance companies, which ones are A's, B's, what states they're in, who's good to work with. So all of that is here in this book for you guys to be able to go through and help make an informed, educated decision on what it is you're going to move into. And the next thing we wanna talk about is some daily chores that we have to take care of in our home in order to keep it looking nice. Now that you found that place to live, you've negotiated your rent and your lease and got it all worked out with the land person and you're moving in, getting your furniture set up, the next part of being an adult is maintaining that space. Um, there are several ways to do this. None of them, I will say, are the right way. The only way wrong is to not take part in it. So I'm just going to show you some places to get sources. And I say pick a system and go with it. So one good place you can look right here is in the library's catalog. And here I'm going to put house cleaning. See that autofill? I've already looked it up. The first thing that comes up in our catalog, it says is in all of the Pines Library. So while these may be excellent books, they are not easily accessible right here, right now. Um, we're getting better at getting them easily accessible where they're coming from the other libraries over. You can still request them. They do come. They just don't come as quick as they used to. So I'm going to drop this down and head to just the ones here in Darty County and hit search. These are the results that come up. Um, how to clean practically anything. Speed cleaning, that's my kind of cleaning. Um, cut your cleaning time in half. I'm um, cleaning your home fast for busy moms. 
Um, sink reflections, real simple cleaning, 2001 amazing cleaning secrets. And you can tell just this right here, it's a huge market of people trying to tell you how to clean your house. We even had was Marie Kondo coming out telling us to hold it. And if it sparks joy, then keep it. Do what works for you. Just make sure you're doing something. If you need more sources and you don't think the books are quite the way that you want to go, something else that I personally think works well is heading over to Pinterest. And Pinterest, I put up here at the top, cleaning schedule printable. I like to have something concrete that I can check, give myself a star and reward me because yes, I am an adult cleaning that I actually did something. So here we've got the weekly cleaning schedules, several different forms of them. Um, some of them on here um, are blank so that you can fill in what it is you want to work on cleaning on. Some of them have filled in there for you. You can go as far as to um, some of them will have weekly chores to do versus monthly chores, something you do every once in a while. Look at that, declutter your home in 30 days. Good luck. Um, so there's there's not really a wrong way or right way to go about cleaning everything. The main thing is you just have to make sure you're doing it. Hi, everybody. For this part of Adulting 101, so far we've been talking a little bit about finding the place we're going to live and some cleaning maintenance. But now what I wanted to focus on with you guys was some do-it-yourself tips. So I found this book at the library called DIY for renters don't call the landlord and um, it's got some nice tips in there and ways to do things so that you can fix things around the house without having to call them wait on the landlord all the time and landlords a lot of times um, around here we have a lot of property companies and it seems to take forever it seems like for some of your repairs to get done and some repairs you might feel guilty about asking I know for me, this would be one of them. Um, and so in this book, it's got a way to fix it. So we're gonna look at this book as we go and see if we can take care of the hole in the wall. Um, my hole happened to come from a towel rod that was there. And my daughter had pulled the towel down instead of just lifting it off the rod and it pulled it out. So the other end of it is still here. So we can still put it on there. I can still fix it. I just gotta get rid of the hole first. So we are going to start with the directions in the book and see what happens. So the very first thing it says is if it's a small hole that you wanna do something called dimpling, which is after you've removed whatever was in the hole is using the metal end of a spackling knife or the edge of a ham hammer, you slightly dimple the hole's edge around the perimeter. When the hole is not dimpled, the hole will create a high spot in the wall. So that would be taking a small hammer, which I happen to have, I also have this spackling knife, and just kind of going around the edge. Now my hole's a little bit bigger than that. And what you're aiming to do is a lot of times when you take a picture out of the wall, it leaves this stuff kind of sticking out and you're trying to get it to go back in so it's not sticking out. Mine's a little bit bigger. So it's more of a medium size hole. And in here it says medium size holes will create when removing a wall anchor or a toggle bolt, which will require the whole edge to be dimpled in the same way as a small hole. The spackling finish of these screw holes will be covered and the drywall finish repair sections. So with this one, I could probably get away of dimpling the edges and repairing it as a small hole. But since I want to reuse it, and I wanted to show you these are the anchors that were holding it in there. So that was what was in side the wall that came out. All right, since I want to reuse it to put this back up there, if I repair the hole with just spackling, it's just gonna come right back out. So I'm gonna try this third method, which is a large hole. So down here with the large hole, we're going to use a straight line and a level, and we're gonna draw horizontal and vertical lines around the damaged area. And by doing that, we're gonna make a box. So that's where we will start. All right, so I've got a level, a level here, and I have got a pencil, and I'm gonna to try to level off and make a square to the edge, like it said in the book.
All right, there. So now I have the box drip drawn around my hole. And now I need a drywall saw to cut out the hole. So now we've got the hole in the wall, as it is shown in the book. And so the next thing we are going to do is we're going to cut a piece of wood, generally half to three quarter inch in thickness and two to three inches longer than the vertical lines drawn on the drywall. So I have a piece of wood. It's actually even taller, so I'm gonna to have to cut mine down on both sides. It is 3 8 inch. It didn't cost very much. I think it was like $2 for the piece of wood. I'm obviously only gonna use a little bit. What I didn't tell y'all is I've got three of these I need to do in my house. So I'm gonna take a minute to cut this down to size and then I'll continue. All right, I've got my piece of wood now and I took measurements here on it so we could see how big I needed to make it. And now it will fit into the hole. So now I need some way to anchor this so that I can put it into the hole. So I'm just going to take a wood screw. I'm going to screw it here into the center just so that I have something to hold on to the piece of wood with. So all I've done now is I put a screw right there in the center just so I have something to hold on to it with. So now we're going to put it into the wall. And so it's back there. Um, this is an awfully small hole so it's kind of hard to see. Let's see if I can get it. So we come over here and look. You can see the piece of the wood is back there. It's got the screw in there. And now what I'm gonna do is put a screw on either side. So there'll be one right here, one over here on this side, just to hold this little piece in place. So I will be right back with that. Well, since I left you, I learned first, I forgot to put my mic on for the last section. So I apologize if that can be heard. But what I've done is I put a screw into the center of this piece of wood. And that was just so I could hold it. I made it small enough that I was able to get it back here in the wall. And then once it was back there, I threaded it through and held it. And what I realized, two things. One, it's really hard to hold this screw and try to hold this screw and to drill it in. So I did call for help for somebody to come in and hold the board so that I could screw. Two, pre-drill the wood. <laughs> if um, when I was screwing these two in, it was really hard to get it through the wood in the back without it being pre-drilled. So what I am going to do, and most of you, if you're just repairing a hole in the wall that you punched in there when you're mad about something or drop the treadmill through it or whatever, may not have to worry about it. But since I am trying to replace the towel rod and I want it to be even across, I've got to take into consideration where the one that is still here is still there. So I took the cover off of my towel rod. This is normally sitting on this side, just so I can see where this how the screws were. From there, I'm going to take my piece of wood that I've got left, and I'm going to take my level, and I'm going to figure out where these screws are going to be on this end so that I can go ahead and pre-drill that hole so that when I'm going to put the final product in, it'll go in much easier. So I can see right now that come up just a little bit and then I'm gonna drop 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 about right here is where I'll need to pre-drill for the top one and then I'll do the bottom one in a minute so once I've got that part done I'll come in and check in with you again all right so all I did was pre-mark and pre-drill where those were the next step in our book is now we've gotten the board placed up here so now we're going to come over here to seven, which is where we're going to measure and mark a new piece of drywall that is an inch shorter in height and length than the drywall repair cutout opening. And it says to use a straight edge to connect the horizontal and vertical marks to create the cut lines. When cutting the drywall, use a drywall saw job for the first shorter line and drawn for the pieces. And then eight, it says to use a utility knife with a new blade to score the second longer line drawn for the piece size. 
So the next thing we're doing here is get our drywall. I was able at my local big box store to find just short drywall. So I didn't have to buy a full sheet. I was able to buy a smaller sheet since I just have three little holes like this to fit. So I'm gonna cut out our patch and measure that, get it ready, and then we'll check in again for the next stop. All right, gang, I wanna be real for a minute. I was really nervous about doing this. In fact, like I've been walking around all morning with a stomach ache going, okay, I've gotta record this video because I've told everybody that this is what I was gonna do on this video. But I hadn't patched holes before and anytime I've tried to do anything with drywall, it turns out really, really bad. Like I didn't do this, but I'm gonna show it to you because this is probably better than what mine ends up like. I don't know if you guys can see this spot right here where it's obviously been done, all right? So um, I'm getting kind of excited now because this is actually for real working. All right. So I told you all at the beginning that this is probably a medium sized hole and then I probably didn't need to go through all of these steps to fix it. And the reason I wanted to do it was because I really want to put the towel rod back up. So the next thing I've done is I've got my little piece that I've cut out of the big piece of drywall that I showed you earlier. And I'm taking it, I'm putting it into my hole Oh my gosh, look at that, you guys, it fits. Okay, so now it's in there. In the book, it says the next thing you should do then is to screw this or attach this to the wall. I'm not as worried about doing that right now. One, because it's not a big hole. Two, I'm going to be screwing it in and attaching it with the anchor when I put that in there for my, dry, for my towel rod. So this is the exciting part. <laughs> okay. So now that I've got that up there and it's matching, I'm looking at the book now while I'm talking to you. It's matching. It says the next thing to do is to do the fiber tape. Okay, mine's yellow, which is an absolutely awful color, but it was cheap. It sells sticks. So all I've got to do is put it over what I've done here. As such, it's holding it down. I've got my putty knife so I can attach it, make it so it stays really well. Notice it's gonna grab that little piece there some, it's gonna hold it too. I wonder if I can rip it with this or if I need scissors. Oh, it rips too, look at that. Okay, put that back on there. This is where y'all start commenting about, oh my gosh, that technique. All right, so there's that side. I'll put some on this side. Now the drywall tape, what it's supposed to do is one, help it stay, but it also helps prevent bubbling when you start putting the actual, um, adhesive the plaster on there. So there's that piece. And we'll see if I can get this tore off again. Tore that one a bit nicer than the first one. I did notice when I was at my favorite big box store that they had kits that you could buy that come with the mesh in them. It comes with the putty thing. It comes with the putty and the knife that you can just use. It comes for small holes. It comes for medium holes. I think it costs like 10 bucks, which is a pretty good deal if you were to ask me. So there is the mess patch being bright yellow. All right, let's see if we got any tips for this next part. All right, so we're caught up with the book here. We've added the mesh. So now the next part it skips is to another chapter about drywall repairs. So we're gonna flip here and it says we need spackle, we need sandpaper, um, paper tape, but we have the silk stick, we have the mesh. So we've put the mesh on. So then the next thing is we're gonna place spackling over that hole. We're gonna apply pressure to flatten it. And then with a clean knife, we'll re-swap the spackling for a clean first coat. We'll allow it to dry before we add an additional coat or worry about sanding any of it. My big box store also had this pink drywall. It doesn't stay pink, but when you're putting it on, it's pink so you can see it's wet and you know it's dry when it's white again which I thought was helpful for me because I have absolutely no patience whatsoever. So I got the pink spackle, my knife with its sticker still on it. Let's see if I can take that sticker off. 
I don't know if it'll make a difference or not. This really isn't my thing. It did not come off nicely. Alrighty. So, there's still one on the back side. Let's grab some pink spackle here. And we're gonna take it and we're just gonna mush it on here so it gets through all of these little putties and all of the little meshes. We want to get down in all the creases. So I'm gonna mesh it in there good and make sure it's on there. So here I am with the finished product that I've worked on today. So um, when we started, you know, you saw that there was a big hole here. Well, not a big hole, medium sized hole. And I have patched to put it in and it is up there. I obviously didn't repaint, which would be a lot easier to do before I put that up there. The reason I didn't paint though is um, our lease, which we talked about earlier when we were talking about that, says that we can't paint without permission and we didn't have that. So, um, that doesn't mean I will ever. Um, we may be able to get permission to redo this after we've been here for a bit, but for now I've done it and my towel rod is back up here. And as long as nobody's pulling towels down off of it, it should be fine. Um, so that's the conclusion of our DIY part of fixing a hole in the wall. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. And we look forward to seeing you next month when we talk about um, health insurance plans and ways to make sure you get your best coverage. Thanks. Bye.